Hello, good evening. Good evening, teacher. How are you? Good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, it's time to uh, begin the class. And today is the session number three. And we are going to talk about pronunciation and phrasal verbs. And what are the uses? We are going to talk about um, how different uh, groups uh, use a deep pronunciation of some words. But before we uh, enter this uh, topic, we are going to uh, talk about the last classes, the session number one and session number two. And in the last um, week, we were talking about different topics that we have here. Some of them, we are going just to do a little review of those uh, topics that we were uh, talking about the last week. And we have here some examples of the topics that we were um, talking about. First, we were talking about two-part verbs. That is the topic that we are uh, developing um, already. And we have some examples. Uh, what are the two-part verbs? Uh, how many types do we have? Some specification. We have uh, some examples. Uh, we were talking about those uh, verbs and the uh, meanings in Spanish, then how to use them. Also, we were talking about, uh, we did an exercise where you um, find the correct um, position of the words. And now we are going to talk about also about the uh, two-part verbs. But in this case, we are talking about pronunciation and how to pronounce these two part verbs. And also we are going to talk about the phrasal verbs. That is the two topics that we are going to develop in this session. So we are going to start with the, to the topic number one, that is pronunciation. We know that it's very important that we um, pronounce the words in the correct way but we have to take some things into consideration because um, when we talk, it's a very a different way to talk about different words for each person. For example, maybe when I'm talking, 
I um, pronounce the words in a different way that some other people uh, did. But in this case, when we are talking in a different language that is not our mother language, is um, kind of difficult because we have some words that we can pronounce in the way other people do. But that is not something that we can uh, worry about. Sometimes we want to um, talk like native speakers of different countries. We are not talking just from the United States, but we were we are going to say, um, I want to talk like that person and she is from UK, or I want to talk like that man, he is from the United States, or I want to talk like um, that person and he is from Guatemala, for example. But we need to uh, have this in mind. The way we pronounce the words, it's depending on the way we talk. For example, in Spanish, when we were uh, talking with different people, we can uh, tend to change a little bit the pronunciation of the words and the way we talk about some situations and uh, maybe we can make mistakes in our mother language. And that's normal because we are maybe uh, tired, we are excited, uh, we are angry, we are uh, happy. And those uh, feelings can change the pronunciation of the words and the way we um, elevate the voice uh, the tone of voice when we are angry, when we are excited that we tend to um, talk very, very fast. And there are a lot of things that we have to consider when we talk in a language, our mother language, a different language, uh, whatever language we want to speak. Para el tema de pronunciación, recordemos, La manera en la que cada uno de nosotros pronuncia las palabras es una manera específica, especial, ¿verdad? No es que tenemos que repetir y eh, decir esas palabras de la misma manera que otras personas las ha dicho. Las decimos de la manera que nosotros eh, las pronunciamos porque a veces tenemos eso de que cuando hablamos hay palabras que nos salen con una pronunciación un poco diferente, pero eso no significa que estén malas sino que es la manera en la que nosotros pronunciamos. Existen difer diferentes eh, tonalidades, ¿verdad? Para las palabras, para las expresiones, eh, también hay diferentes variaciones a la hora de hablar según la región. Y that's okay. But in this case, we are talking um, about the, um, an article that describes the various ways in which the Macmillan Phrasal Verb Plus Dictionary deals with pronunciation and stress. Hay un artículo que es de Macmillan Phrasal Verb Plus Dictionary, diccionario, que nos va a decir cómo ellos trabajan con la pronunciación y el estrés de las palabras. In this case, with the two use this article to um, make a comparison of the pronunciation of the words that we make every day and how they um, can say we can do it. So in this case, uh, it also explains some types of rules or some simple rules that will help you to pronounce phrasal verbs confidently when they form part of a sentence. Uh, in this article, we can find some rules to help us to pronounce these uh, two part verbs or phrasal verbs um, in a confident way because maybe when we um, have problems or troubles with some words, we tend to, to look like ter terrified because we say, mm, people will know that I am nervous or people will know that I can pronounce this word correctly. But in this case, we have to be very confident to talk uh, in a different language. And it's very important to um, demonstrate that we know what are uh, what we are talking about and maybe we can make mistakes but that is not the important point because 
people are hearing us and are understanding us. So when we use a dictionary, what the dictionary shows? ¿Qué nos muestra el diccionario? The, uh, in this article says that this dictionary shows the pronunciation and stress pattern of each base verb using the IPA or International Phonetic Alphabet. In these dictionaries, that is very, very helpful that we have this kind of a dictionary when we are uh, trying to learn a different language because they have this IPA, that is the International Phonetic Alphabet. They show us how to write these words with the symbols. And this is important because we try to say the word in that way. We try to learn to read those symbols. And that is very important because they help us to pronounce better the words. En el diccionario, si ustedes tienen un diccionario en la mano, lo pueden revisar. Aparece una parte donde viene la palabra en símbolos. Y eso es, eh, tiene que ver con el, el alfabeto que conocemos en fonética. Y ese alfabeto o, o esas palabras que están escritas en símbolos nos ayudan a pronunciar mejor las palabras. Porque nos dan el ejemplo de cómo deberían de sonar. Because the, the phonetic is the sound, the, the pronunciation of the words. So we can find the word, the symbols, and the meaning of the word. But that, is, that is not the, the important point. The important point is to see, to, to try to read, to learn how to pronounce those symbols because they can help us to improve our language and our pronunciation. Then in most cases, a single pronunciation is given. In some cases, there is just one pronunciation, and this can be used in all varieties of English. But where a verb is pronounced differently in British and American English, both pronunciations are shown, with the British version first and the American version second. When the word has um, two different pronunciations in the dictionary, they show us the uh, different pronunciation in British and in American English. And we can use the word that we want to, to use because in this case, it's not important that we um, use just one um, way to, to say a word. We can use the British version, we can use the American version, we can use the Indian version, we can use uh, the Poland version, whatever English we want to say, the pronunciation that we want to use. Uh, the important point is to try to learn how to pronounce it in the different uh, kind of pronunciations. Um, and in the dictionary, we can find both British and English, and we can use um, the one that we want to, to to experiment in the one we want to say in some conversation. But in some cases, we just find one way to pronounce the word because it is like um, the main version of that word. In the dictionary, we will find the two, the American or the Estadounidense and the English of Inglaterra, which shows us two ways to pronounce it. You know that in Inglaterra is a different way to pronounce the English que en Estados Unidos. Entonces nos van a presentar las dos formas en las que se pronuncia esa palabra según el acento que nosotros queramos tener, tanto el British como el American. Y podemos verlos ahí en el diccionario. When a verb ends with a letter R, the usual pronunciation rules apply. In British English, the R is not normally pronounced unless it is followed by a vowel sound. So the R in hanker is pronounced in the phrasal verb hanker after, hanker after. It says that in some cases, the R letter in some British pronunciations, we can uh, say it because it is not pronounced. And maybe if they have a 
vowel after we can say it, but in that case that we don't have an vowel after the R or R sound, it, we can pronounce that sound. But in English, it's always pronounced. That is some of the difference that we have in British English and the American English, that the R sound is pronounced in American English, but not in British English. Then we are going to talk about the stress. And it says that the stress pattern for each individual Trace over is shown using the symbol and we have like this, like that symbol. To show primary, express Okay, we have something here. In this case, when we are using the stress of the pronunciation, we have different symbols. In this case, we have the first symbol that shows the primary stress and the second uh, symbol show us the secondary stress. And we are going to see something like that because we have some examples. In the first one, we have this uh, symbol in the word play. Then we have, again, the same symbol around. Then we have, again, play with the same symbol. And we have, in the second word that we don't have any stress. Number three, we have play down that the stress is in the, um, in the Primary uh, stress, play, and again, down. Then again, play, on, doesn't have any stress. Then play, up. But in this case, we can use it like this. up, then we have again play, again up, on, oh, two, and the last one, play with. We have the stress in some of these words. For example, play around, play around, play at, play down, play on, play up, play up to, and play with. It said that getting the stress right, the main pronunciation uh, question with phrasal verbs concern the placement and a distribution of the stress of the verb the particle and the other words in the sentence. In this case, uh, that we are talking about the phrasal verbs, we want to know how to pronounce them and how or where is the uh, stress in the word. How can we say these phrasal verbs when we were talking with some people or how can we pronounce these phrasal verbs in the sentence and all of the words of the sentence? So we have some guidelines to know how to pronounce these words 
or where is the stress? So we are going to um, write like this. Here are some guidelines to help you. And we have number one. stress patterns and we have the first one two main types it says with a few exceptions phrasal verbs have either one stress it says that they have one stress in the word some exceptions but it says Just one stress in the phrasal verb. And we have this example that is the primary. Make or make or up, down, make or up, down, make or. In this case, when we have the symbol or, or some uh, marks that we know that there is the stress. And it is the same in Spanish that we have some words that we have the uh, um, the tone of the voice that is a strong. The most strong uh, uh, way to say a word is distress. In this case, we have this symbol to help us to pronounce this word, make four. Then we have two stresses in some in one word or in one phrase. We have two types. We have this example, make of. Make of, make of, again, up and up, make of. Tenemos dos tipos de estrés en las palabras. Tenemos el primero, que es aquel que solo tiene una parte, que solo una parte tiene el estrés. Pero tenemos otras eh, phrasal verbs que tienen dos eh, es, eh, partes con estrés. Entonces, una, solo se va a pronunciar una de las dos eh, palabras que componen el phrasal verb con eh, fuerza, ¿verdad? Con la, la mayor fuerza de voz. Y en la otra, pues, las dos tienen como una fuerza de voz bastante irregular. And we have some examples. Phrasal verbs with one stress have the many stress of the verb and no stress on the particle. En el primer tipo, el estrés va a estar siempre en el verbo, no en la partícula. El verbo siempre va a llevar el estrés en ese tipo de eh, phrasal verbs with one stress. Siempre, siempre lo va a llevar en el verbo. Phrasal verbs with two stresses have the primary stress on the particle and the secondary stress on the verb. Dice que en los verbos, que, en los phrasal verbs que tienen dos eh, partes con estrés, la partícula va a tener el primary stress, va a tener el estrés primario y el verbo va a tener el estrés secundario. Siempre va a ser de esa misma manera. Sometimes the same phrasal verb can have different stresses depending on its meaning. The dictionary treats these cases as separate phrasal verbs. We have the same example, live on. The animals live on bamboo shoots. And then we have another uh, meaning of this one, live on. Long after her death, her memory lives on. And the dictionary takes them as separate phrasal verbs because of the meaning. 
cuando tenemos phrasal verbs que tienen el mismo significado, el diccionario los toma como dos eh, frases diferentes porque tienen un significado diferente y sus estrés son diferentes. Así como el ejemplo de live on, que el primero de animals, live on bamboo shoots, viven, como vivir, estar en ese lugar. And then, eh, long after her death, her memory lives on. Después de su muerte, la memoria seguía viva. Yeah, different meanings. Then, we have some examples. Phrasal verbs with one stress. In this case, we have with one stress. And it says the single stress is on the first word. Which is the verb? The second word which is the particle has no stress. And then we have some examples. We have here, it says, make up, make up. And we have an, a sentence. What do you make of it? What do you make of it? What do you make of it? Make up of down. Then we have another one. Here for. Here for. And we have the sentence. Would you care? Would you care for some tea? In this case, this one have some stress tea. Would you care for some tea? Would you care for some tea? And we have another one. Agree, agree with, agree with. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. That's the difference in the pronunciation. The first one, make up. What do you make of it? Would you care for some tea? Would you care for some tea? I agree with you. I agree with you. Then we have in some uh, phrasal verbs, of this type, the particle is a preposition. Like, and we have some examples. Like, at, for, from, of, or to. These particles often have both a strong form, such as, and we have some examples. At, From, of. So in these cases, uh, when we use the, um, the particles, there are prepositions. And these prepositions have 
um, have two types of um, sound. We have a strong and weak. And in this case, a from of are the strong pronunciation. And we have uh, some weak pronunciation of the same word. In this case, it's based on the, um, the writing form or the phonetic pron pronunciation because of the symbols at, from, of, and then at, from, of. It's the pronunciation of the symbols. But let me see if I can uh, show you those uh, symbols. So let me uh, stop this and I will show you the difference in the symbology of this strong and weak pronunciation of the same um, preposition. Tenemos preposiciones que sirven como um, las partículas, ¿verdad? De estos, um, de estos uh, super verbs or phrasal verbs. Y esos mismos, eh, esas mismas preposiciones tienen dos tipos de pronunciación, la fuerte y la débil, pero básicamente es por la manera en la que eh, se escribe la simbología en fonética. Así que voy a mostrarles esa simbología de at from a mouth, de cómo se escribe eh, la manera débil y la manera fuerte. So, let me see. There he is. Let me see if I can copy this to show you. Yes, I have the pronunciation here. But in this case, they don't have one of the symbols because I can copy this one. Hmm. So let me show you like this. Okay. Okay, in this case, in the screen is the uh, way to write these, uh, these prepositions and we have the symbols. And one of the, the first one are the uh, strong ones and the second one are the weak ones. And they are different for the symbol that uh, precedes the, the consonant. And that is the way to uh, know what are the strong ones and which are the, um, the weak ones. But th in this case, um, if we want to talk about uh, phonetics, it is a different uh, kind of a study that we have to do to understand the symbols to, um, to talk about in a better way because uh, phonetics is, um, one of the one important branch of English language because we can explore the pronunciation of some words and it, it helps us to uh, talk better. Um, para los que quieren seguir estudiando inglés, que les interesa mucho esto del inglés, eh, pueden estudiar la parte fonética porque es una rama bastante importante del inglés porque nos habla de los sonidos, de la gesticulación, de la pronunciación y nos enseña a través de símbolos cómo podemos pronunciar las palabras y qué sonidos eh, podemos hacer, ¿verdad? But that is um, a very, very um, different topic. So in this case, we have the symbols here that are from the strong and weak uh, form of the prepositions. So, let uh, continue with uh, this topic of the pronunciation of the phrasal verbs. So let's continue with the other document.
So it is usually the weak form that is used in phrasal verbs with one stress. However, if the particle comes at the end of the phrase, the strong form will be used. Todd is still unstressed. It says, if we have a phrasal verb with one stress, um, these phrasal verbs have the preposition. And in this case, we have the with form because we have an stress before. In el caso de los eh, phrasal verbs que ya tienen estrés en la primera palabra, que es el verbo, el complemento o esta partícula que nosotros tenemos después del verbo, no le vamos a, eh, no le vamos a poner ese tipo de estrés, sino que vamos a utilizar la pronunciación débil de la preposición. Then, the speaker might also choose to stress the particle to convey a particular meaning. For example, an emphasis or contrast or correction. In this case, the speaker is following the normal rules of stress placement in discourse. In this case, when we were, um, when we are talking about a specific uh, topic, we can change the way we, we pronounce some words. In this case, it is about the emphasis, the contrast and corrections. And that are different ways to pronounce the words. Because when we are talking um, and we, were, um, we are trying to emphasize something, we um, put some a specific form at the words because we were we want the people understand what we are saying and we speak in a different tone of voice that is um, that a uh, tone of voice that we are uh, maybe talking slowly and we uh, mark the words with a strong pronunciation because we want to people understand that idea then a contrast, or maybe when we are angry and something is um, bothering us, we talk in a different way. And we are, when we are correcting people, that is very important because when we correct someone, we use a different tone of voice because we want that person understand where is the mistake. So in this case, um, this uh, pronunciation depends on the situation and the moment we are living in that uh, specific time. En esta parte, eh, estamos hablando de que nosotros ponemos la pronunciación, el, el, el tono de la voz según lo que queremos lograr, ya sea un énfasis, un contraste o una corrección. Eh, cuando queremos corregir a alguien, pues obviamente utilizamos un tono de voz, eh, en muchos de los casos bastante suave, donde tratamos de que esa persona entienda, comprenda dónde está el error y que lo corrija. En el énfasis, a veces tal vez eh, marcamos demasiado las palabras para que nos entiendan. Por ejemplo, eh, fuiste a la tienda, yo te pedí eh, un jugo de naranja, pero tú me trajiste... Um, agua mineral, pero yo quería jugo de naranja. We uh, make that uh, a strong mark of the words. Then we have the phrasal verb with two stress. We saw the phrasal verbs with one stress. With two stresses. And it says,
Okay, in this case, in the phrasal, the phrasal verbs with two stresses, it says that these phrasal verbs have both primary and secondary stress. The primary stress is on the second word, that is the particle, and the secondary stress is on the first word, that is the verb. And more, uh, most phrasal verbs are like this, that they have uh, these two different types of, um, of stresses in the words. And we have some examples, make out, turn on. And the, we have in the secondary stress in the verb and the primary uh, stress in the, uh, in the particle. En estos verbos, en estos eh, phrasal verbs que tienen dos estreses o que tienen dos tipos de estrés, vemos el estrés primario y el secundario y el primario se pone en lo que es la partícula y el secundario se pone en lo que es el verbo. No es como el, 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 el um, phrasal verb with one stress that we use the stress in the verb. In this case, the primary stress is in the particle and the secondary stress is on the verb. These phrasal verbs are separable. That is, the verb and the particle can be separate with the object of the verb coming between them. Separable uh, phrasal verbs can be used in three possible ways. And these effects where the stress falls. The dictionary tells you which of these three ways you can use for particular phrasal verbs. In this case, we know that some of the phrasal verbs are unseparable, but in this case, uh, this kind of um, phrasal verbs that have two different types of stress uh, are separable and they can be separated by the object. And also the dictionary explains the three ways um, that we can use these phrasal verbs. Estos phrasal verbs son, eh, se pueden separar, el verbo y la partícula pueden funcionar juntos eh, y separados por un objeto. Entonces, el diccionario, así como lo dice el artículo, nos está enseñando cómo es que funciona esto. Y vamos a ver cuáles son esas tres, eh, tres maneras en las que pueden funcionar estos phrasal verbs. So, Separate. Separable phrasal verbs. And be used in three different, in three possible ways. And this affects where the stress falls. We have number one, when the object is a pronoun. And we have uh, the explanation. When the object of a separable phrasal verb
Okay, number one. Uh, when the object is a pronoun, when the object of a separable phrasal verb is a pronoun, it must come between the verb and the particle. Cuando el objeto de nuestra oración es un pronombre, tiene que ir, esto es de ley, ¿verdad? Tiene que ir en medio entre el verbo y la partícula. For example, can you make it out? Can you make it out? En este caso, cuando tenemos este tipo de phrasal verbs, that is uh, the object, a pronoun, they come between the verb and the particle. Then we have the number two. When the object is a noun coming between the verb and particle. Again, we have, uh, in this case, uh, it's talking about the stress. We can say, oh, but, but in this case, number one and number two, it's almost the same. But if you uh, read carefully the number one and number two, they are really, really different. Why? In this case, in the number one, it says, when the object is a pronoun, it must come between the verb and the particle. But in the second one, it says, when the object is a noun coming between the verb and a particle, we, uh, the stress will usually be on the noun rather than on the particle. En, la, en el primer caso, solo escribimos el pronombre entre lo que es el verbo y la partícula. But in the second uh, case, en, el, en el, la parte número dos, no simplemente vamos a escribir el nombre e entre lo que es el verbo y la partícula, sino que cambiamos el estrés. El estrés recae en el nombre y no en la partícula. Esa es la diferencia. It's not the same. They are very different. Then we have the example. Can you make the, here we have the stress, the writing out and the particle ends with no stress. So the straight, the stress change position with the noun that is between the verb and the particle. Then we have number three. When the object is a noun coming after the verb and particle. If the noun is important for the speakers Okay, it says, 
when the object is a noun coming after the verb and particle. If the noun is important for the speaker's meaning, then it will be uh, stressed and the stress and the particle may be lost. Solo si el nombre es importante para el significado del, eh, del que habla, ¿verdad? Vamos a, a ponerle el estrés a ese nombre y el estrés de la partícula se va a perder. Si el nombre no es importante para el que habla, then we are not going to use the stress on the word. So we have the example. Can you make out? The writing. In this case, we can say that the word writing is very important or has, or has a meaning for the, um, for the speakers. So in this case, the uh, nouns have the stress and the particle lost the stress. So can you make out the writing? They have the stress. So this is the, um, the end for the topic of pronunciation. Now we are going to talk about the modal verbs. That is another important topic, modal verbs. First, we have to know what are uh, the modal verbs, and we have some lists. The modal verbs are can, may, must, shall, will, cool, might, Sure. Well. Vamos con la parte de los modal verbs. Esa lista que está ahí es la lista de modal verbs. Can, may, must, shall, will, could, might, should, and will. And it says that we use modal verbs to show if we believe something in certain, possible, or impossible. But I'm going to insert this one that is a text box to write down. And it says, we use the model verbs to show if we believe something, entertain, possible or impossible. Dice que nosotros utilizamos los modal verbs para eh, mostrar si creemos que algo es seguro, certain, Posible o imposible. And we have some examples. My kids must be in the car. It might rain tomorrow. And the last one, that can be, Peter, coach, too small. Okay, to retain possible or impossible. The first one is certain. My kids must be in the car. 
I have lost my keys. I can find my keys. Then I said, well, my keys must be in the car because it is the last place that I saw my keys. So it's retained that they are there. Then possible in my rain tomorrow, maybe it can be, it's possible that tomorrow rains, but that is no uh, true fact. Then impossible, that can be Peter's coat. It's too small, it can be because it is too small. Tenemos tres eh, tipos de cosas que queremos mostrar con los eh, eh, modal verbs. Algo que es eh, cierto, ¿verdad? Certain, algo que es posible, possible, y algo que es imposible, impossible. En el primer ejemplo estamos hablando de algo seguro, que dije mis llaves en el carro, tienen que estar en el carro. No las encontré por ningún lado, están en el carro. It's certain. En possible, es posible que llueva, ¿verdad? Mañana. Puede que llueva mañana. It's possible. Y la última, no puede ser el, el abrigo de Peter porque es muy pequeño. That's something impossible. We also use them to do things like talk about ability, ask permission, and make requests and offers. So it is not just a, a talk about certain something possible or something impossible. We also use them to talk about ability to ask for permission and may request in offers. They have a lot of um a lot of uses. So we use them to talk about some things chain, possible or impossible, but also we can use them to talk about ability to ask for permission and to make a request and offers, but uh, those uses, uh, we are going to develop those uses tomorrow because now it's time to end this session. But before to end, um, espero que estén trabajando, verdad, en la plataforma. Es importante que eh, sigan trabajando en la plataforma. Ya pueden ir avanzando lo más que puedan para que no se queden sin tiempo a la hora de terminar todos los ejercicios. Si tienen dudas o preguntas con los ejercicios, ustedes saben que está el grupo, para que puedan pedir ayuda con algún ejercicio. Así que si no han entrado a la plataforma, tienen que comenzar a trabajar en ella, porque ahí se va marcando su eh, progreso con lo que es el curso. So, let's see each other tomorrow. Now it's time to say goodbye. See you tomorrow and have a good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, teacher. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. See you.